Then the second theory that's kind of, not kind of, but is beneficial for us to think about when we look at third space theory and our conception of the internet or cyberspace as being a, a third space is the one from Edward Soja or Soha. Um, he's a critical geographer from um, working largely in thinking about um, Los Angeles and large cities and like that. Um, what he, what he uh, thinks about is he, he, start, he's th he, he looks at space, third space as being an actual space, an actual geographic location, some place, okay? which is kind of against our conception of what cyberspace is. We think of cyberspace, when people talk about it, it's sort of this nebulous thing that just sort of flows around as you know, we access with our computers. The internet's sort of there. It's not an actual physical location. But we'll get to that part in a, in a couple of minutes. But anyway, um, so he thinks about, he wanted to think about the space, and often when we think of a space, in geography in particular, or just as, you know, normal people, we just think of the physical characteristics of the, of the space. With his theory, which he also calls third place theory, is that we have to consider the social and historical aspects of the space that we're in. There are things, how we act in the space, and this goes back again to the identity um, formation that I talked about in the first part. Now you can see that, okay, if identity is acting, then the space determines a lot of how we act. It's not just our wish to bring what we wish to bring culturally, but the space itself, the physical constrictions or the physical constraints of the space and affordances of the space affect the way we act or able to create or negotiate our identity. I guess it's a better way to look at it. So he asked us to think about the actual space of the space, the physical characteristics, the historical uses and other ways that links of that space, how it was created, why it came there, what made it, those kinds of things, how it's been used in the past. Um, and the social aspect. What is its space? What is its function? Space. Its function socially. That's a pretty interesting way to think of thing. Think of things. So when we start to think about space like that, it starts to determine um, determine the way that we act and the way that society and uh, reacts to things about it. Uh, a good example would be um, when someone takes some religious place of religious worship and decides to turn it into a restaurant. You can see the culture or the people, the society, the citizens around it often react in a very vehemently and negatively about that. They see it as a affront to the historical meaning of that building, the cultural and social meaning of that building. It's not just a space. It's not just like, wow, this is a great big, beautiful, open space that I can put my restaurant in. It's got these other aspects to it. And you can also infer from the vehemence of people's reaction to this, you know, proposed restaurant in a house of worship that the their cultural ties are stronger as their vehemence, you know, the vehemence, increase, increasing vehemence is an indication of stronger cultural or social ties to this and historical knowledge of this place and the meaning of this place. So now space has a meaning and it's determined by, according to Soja, to these types of things. Uh, those three, that's what he calls a trialectic, the historical, social, and actual spatial part of the space. Well, one large part of this theory is that we should have, that we have to imagine, this is, allows us to, these three elements allow us to imagine new spaces or new uses of spaces that are projected or productive and that we can project into the future and that it could be a useful thing or we can s imagine how these types of things together would lead to some 
ultimate either demise of the space or sort of degeneration of the space, I guess, is a way to look at it.